talk about this evening, the Christians loves, plural. There's a young couple. They haven't been dating too awfully long. They went out one evening, and as they were driving, he had the radio on, and they were driving down the road, and she said, ooh, turn that up. I love that song. In a few minutes, they were talking, and, you know, maybe one or two other songs had played, and she said, oh, I love that song. And then, you know, a few miles down the road, oh, I love that song. Now, here we are about three or four songs in, you know, I love that song, love that song. Then we, the couple went and, and they went to eat. Oh, I love that. Oh, I love this. He was catching on that she had many loves. And eventually he really hoped, not maybe that night, so to speak, but later on that she would love him and he would love her. And I guess it did, 38, 39 years. Is that a pretty accurate story there, dear? Because that's her. That was her. I mean, we drive down the road. I love that song. And I, when we first started dating, I thought, man, this girl's got problems. <laughs> she loves everything. And I guess she does. She loves me. And so, anyway, we have many loves in our life. We really do. I mean, you know, if, if I were to throw out a menu of food and I would say, stay, there'd be a few of you say, well, I love that. And if I said, uh, uh, shrimp. Some of you say, oh, I love that. And if I said, uh, if I said uh, chicken, uh, you know, now that qualifies to be a preacher. <laughs> but, but, yeah, I love that. Some of you would say along those things. Some of you say, no, I don't like that. Or that's not my favorite. I don't care for that. And, and, and because we all have. And then if I went and said, okay, um, you got a choice between movies and, and sports. You know, which would you rather watch on TV? And some of you say, well, I love movies. And some of us, of us would say, no, I love sports. And that's not to say that you don't love the chicken or you don't love the steak as opposed to the movies or the ball games. It's just to say that we have many loves in our life. And I just thought this evening, kind of in a, a, a fast-moving sort of sermon, we would think about the many loves that we have in our life. And one of them is God. You know, when Jesus was asked what was the first and great commandment in Matthew chapter 22, Jesus said, love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. We understand that, of course, to go back to the book of Deuteronomy, a statement that uh, Moses the prophet wrote in the book of Deuteronomy. But yet it is an understanding that this is the call that God has made for us, to love God and to love him with everything that we've got. John put it this way, and I think so succinctly. John talks about in First John chapter 4, John talks about the brother that says that he, he loves God, but he hates his brother. And he says, you can't do that. You can't do that. You can't, you can't say, well, well, I love God, but I hate my brother. And, of course, then the idea is, well, if you love God, you're going to love your brother. But, but the import of the idea is, here is we love God, not that he, not that we love him, but that he first loved us. And so our love really for God is a reciprocal love based upon the fact that he loves us. And that love has caused him to give us countless things that, that we have in our life. And so, so we, we have that love. But in one of the verses that I was thinking about this this week, you know, one of the verses that is very, very common to all of us and we know real well but I wonder if we really stop to just look at part of it as much as we have the other part. Romans 8, 28, all things work together for those that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. We look at the part that where it says all things work together for good. But you see, all things work together for good to those who love the Lord. That's one of our loves. To love God. It's easy to love folks that give you stuff, right? It's easy to love folks that, that, that give you things. That's why we keep giving Graceland stuff. It's so we want her to love us. And so we keep giving her stuff. Well, God gives us everything we have. There's nothing that you don't have, you don't possess, that is not given to you by God. God's the one that, that opens up, if you will, the, the storehouse of heaven. 
You know, the psalmist in Psalm 116 says, I will love the Lord because he has heard my voice. And he's given ear to my supplication. And then he goes on down, you go on down to verse five, and he says, gracious is the Lord. And then you go down and he asks this question. He says, what shall I give to the Lord for all of his benefits towards me? You see, the psalmist there, and really the first 11 verses, that's not all, because he turns then, and he, he makes the statement of, here's what God has done for me, if you read that psalm. And then the last half, really, of that psalm is, is because this is what God has done for me. This is what I do for God. But one of our many loves is just that. Love God with all of your heart. With all of your being, when we love God with everything we have, that means that God comes first in everything we do. And so we love God, but we also love Jesus. We love Jesus, and we love him with all of our heart. God, at various times and various manners, spoke in times past by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, by whom also he made the world and all things therein, who being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person has upholds all things by the power of his word. Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 3. In Hebrews chapter 1, he explains, first of all, the Hebrew writer explains Jesus as a prophet. Now, now sometimes we get upset, we get the idea Jesus is a prophet. But not really. We shouldn't. The word prophet just literally means one who speaks for another. Jesus does that. Jesus came to speak for God. Jesus came to show God to mankind. And so when the, when the Hebrew writer says Jesus spoke for God, the Hebrew writer's right. He came, Jesus came as a prophet to speak for God. But then he came, he came as a priest. Well, we don't like that idea. Well, don't get the idea of what some religious folks believe as a priest. Remember, after all, First Peter chapter two, verse five, and First Peter chapter two, verse nine, we're all priests. As Christians, we're priests. We're of the priesthood of Christ. The idea of, the, of a priesthood. Remember what he says in verse three: "Who, being the brightness of his glory, express the image of his person, when he have uphold all things by the power of his word, did what?" Basically, he died for you. He cleansed you, made you whole. Jesus is a prophet. Jesus is a priest. And Jesus, as a king, he sits with all authority. He sits as the one in charge. He sits as the one that, that is over his kingdom. He sits as the one then is over us. And our lives. He is the ruler. He is the one that we listen to. He came, remember, he came as the angel told Joseph that you'll call his name Jesus and he'll save his people from their sins. He came then in Luke chapter 19. Remember, Jesus had been conversing with Zacchaeus and going to his house. And remember that he said in verse 10 that he says, I am come to seek and save that which is lost. That's my purpose. That's my reason to come to save the lost. He came for us. You ever thought about, you know, why do I come wherever it is? Why, why did I come? Why did I come to this room? Why did I come to this store? Why did I? Jesus understands why he came to this world. He came for us. He came to die for our sins. He came to save mankind. He came to, to, if you will, pay the price that God had set for us. And so we love Jesus for who he is and for what he's done. We love him because he is prophet, priest, and king. We love him because he did what we couldn't do for us, but yet needed at the same time by us. And so, Paul would conclude his epistle to the church at Ephesus. Grace be to those who love the Lord Jesus Christ sincerely.
You ever just pondered that? I mean, that's that's the last words as we have it. That's the last words that Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus. Grace be to those who love the Lord Jesus Christ. It begs the question, first of all, do I love Jesus? Second of all, look at what Paul is saying. Paul is, you might say, in his farewell or in his see you later, uh, is, is the ending to his letter. He is invoking, asking, pushing upon, pressing upon these wonderful brethren God's blessings. But he's also admonishing them to do what? Love Jesus sincerely. And so it reminds us, many loves that we have, we have the love of Jesus, and we love him in sincerity. We love him truth. We love him not with false pretense, but we love him because of who he is and what he's done. Thirdly, we love the truth. The Bible is called several things in, in, in the Bible. It's called the, the truth. It's called, it's called uh, the, the, the law of liberty. It's called the law. It's called the word of God. It's called scriptures. It's called the oracles. The word oracles, by the way, just simply means word. It's called the word. The psalmist talks about Psalm 119, verse 24. He says, I love the law because it's my counselor. And then he says in verse 97 that he loved the Lord or he loved the law with all of his heart. To love the Bible seems like it would be easy, but it's not for some. Some look at this Bible and say, well, it's a good book. Some look at it with the idea, well, you know, it has a few good stories in it and it it tells a good tale. But it's really, it's out of date. It's out of touch. It's not for me, my life. It's not for my family. Some look at it as a decoration piece and they put it in their house somewhere to decorate. Some look at the Bible and, and they say, well, you know, this is a good gift to give somebody. Some folks look at the Bible and they say, well, you know, I understand it's God's word, but I can't understand it. Some see it as it is. It's truth. When Paul would talk about, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, he would talk about that from a child you have known the scriptures which are able to make you wise to salvation. Paul writes to Timothy and he says, you can know the scriptures. And he says that those scriptures will reprove and rebuke and exhort with all long-suffering. There's that idea that they're good for you, and sometimes, though, they're going to hurt you. I like the story that a man shared. I was in a men's Bible study group for uh, several years, and I liked the story one day that he shared. He shared the fact that an individual had gotten a hold of a Bible that he knew. And they had been studying. He had been studying with this man. And he'd spent some time with them, and they had been studying. He and his wife had studied with this man and his wife. And he said, finally, he said, one night in our studies, it was about 11 o'clock. And he said, this man just began to bawl. And he said, now, I want you to know, really, all we've been doing is studying the Bible. And finally, he said, he, when he said, he said, the man kind of got his composure back and he said, what's going on? And he said, all this time, it's been there. And I've just refused to see it till now. The truth is that it's God's word. It is for us. It is for us to live. It is God's instructions. Think about it this way. We often look at the Bible and we look at it as we said, you know, while it's called many names, we look at it as law. Well, who likes law? Who who enjoys the idea of law? Well, a few people. Lawyers, yeah, sure. But very few outside of that. But when we look at the Bible 
as God's revealing of himself to mankind. You see, we get the answer of what we want to know. Every question that we want to know about God and every question we might ask about God is not answered. Why? Because God just gave us what he wanted us to know. There are a few things, according to Deuteronomy 29, 29 and Revelation 22, that aren't revealed. But the things that are revealed are there for us. They are God's revelation of himself. People don't, I don't think they approach the Bible with that aspect. What can I find out about God? And what can I find out about his will? But one of the many loves of the Christian should be, I can find out through studying his word. And so let me read his word and let me find out. And so one of our loves truly is truth. But then also one of our loves is neighbors. When Jesus was asked what was the first and great commandment, he said, love God. And what did he say the second was? Well, love your neighbor as yourself. In Romans chapter 13, verse 8, he says, oh, no man, nothing but to love one another. And then he talks about don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness, honor your father and mother. But he says, love, love your neighbor. I keep getting impressed with this idea, and, and, and I hope really that I'm wrong. But it seems to me that we have begun to love our neighbor less instead of more. As a society, I'm not talking about you all individually, but as a society, we have become intolerant to anyone that does not believe as we believe and that speaks differently than what we speak. And I like to say, I'm not talking about us, but I'm talking about just as a society. And consequently, we have gotten where we don't know our neighbors, we don't want to know our neighbors, and we don't like our neighbors, even though they look at us and we look at them. And we see them from afar. And yet the Bible says, love your neighbors. The Bible says that if you're going to fulfill the royal law according to the scriptures, you're going to do what? James chapter 2, verse 8. You're going to love your neighbor. Paul says, in admonishing the church at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2, walk in love. The Hebrew writer says in Hebrews 13, verse 1, let brotherly love continue. Now, that brotherly love, as we're going to see in just a minute in another one of our loves, I think includes your neighbor. Now, sometimes it is hard to get to know neighbors, and sometimes it is hard to, to meet them and find out about them. But yet at the same time, too, the Good Samaritan teaches us that our neighbor is not just the person that lives across the street. It's not just the person that lives next door. It's not just the person that lives sort of in that angle from our house. A neighbor is anybody we come in contact with. And so one of our many loves should be our neighbor. Now, admittedly, we're not going to love them like we love God. We're not going to love them like we love Jesus. We're not going to love them like we love the truth. But yet at the same point in time, too, the Bible says, love your neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. And so one of our many loves is, is folks, even if we disagree with them. You know, let's think about something for a minute along that line. Jesus ran into a lot of people that didn't agree with him. Jesus, if you will, met heads with folks that called him names and accused him falsely. Jesus did not treat these folks with contempt. He did not treat them with ill will. He did not treat them without compassion and without kindness. Jesus met them with kindness and love. Straightforward, yes. Never wavering in his conviction and in his trust of the Lord. But at the same time, 
he met them with a sense of respect, of love, and honor, even if they disagreed with him. I wish our society would relearn that principle. That's one of the many loves of the Christian. But then there's the brotherhood. We should love the brotherhood. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17, Peter makes that plain. He says, love, love the brotherhood. Wow. Well, who's the brotherhood? Well, it's the family of God, Christians, the church, the kingdom. We love the church. The church must move forward, and the church can only move forward if it does love. You know, remember in the first point we used 1 John chapter 4, verses 20 and 21, where there are individuals that say that I love God, but I hate my brother. And you might say, I don't believe that's ever been done. Oh, yeah, it has. It's done a lot. In in River Road, we we have blessed with a great deal of fellowship and love and appreciation for one another, and it makes for a good setting. Because the church, in order to be united, has to love one another. And in order for the church to move forward, it has to be united. And when the church is not united, it's basically because it doesn't love one another. And because it doesn't love one another, guess what? It's not united. One of the many loves of the Christian is the church. We love to get together. You know, it, I understand Jay gets up on Sunday mornings and starts to make the announcements. And we're still talking. And I understand it is time to start, but I'm just not ready for Jay to start. You know? I want to talk to my brethren. And some of you, bless your hearts, you know, you've been getting here by the skin of your teeth. I'm proud you're here. But if you come earlier, I'll talk to you. And if you stay late, I'll talk to you. I think that's important. It is that fellowship. You see, in Acts chapter 2, the early church continued in fellowship, right? Fellowship. What's fellowship? It's not a meal. It's the idea of getting together, spending time together. Literally, the word is the idea of speaking together. It can also have the idea of joint participation. It's spending time together. That's why if you go back and look at Hebrews chapter 10, where it talks about not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. You see, the Hebrew writer says, come to church. And the reason you come to church is to exhort one another. I'm appreciative and thankful that we have the the telephone program because there are some people that literally physically cannot get out. And and that that happens, you know, maybe if it gets dark, they can't drive or or maybe there are others that we have that do listen that that physically, you know, just can't get out. And and that happens. And I'm thankful that it's there for them. But don't use don't use the telephone program as a crutch. Well, I don't have to go. I can listen. When I could be there. Now, notice what I said when you could be here. Now, if you can't, that's a whole different issue. But you do that, why? Hebrews 10, to exhort one another because the day's coming. And so one of our many loves is simply put, love the brethren. We may not always agree. We may not always see eye to eye, not only just religiously, but politically, socially, uh, things of, of those nature. We may not always see eye to eye on all things, but learn to love. Love the brotherhood. And then we love our families. You know, that they talk about they talk about functional families and dysfunctional families. I think in many ways all families are dysfunctional because there's really the ideal is just it can't it's too ideal. <laughs> and it's hard to meet. 
But families sometimes get crossways, and sometimes they get crossways because there's just difference of thought. Sometimes they get crossways because of money. Sometimes they get crossways because because the, they feel cheated or slighted. Sometimes they, they get crossways because some have been belligerent. Sometimes they get crossways because there's just the idea of I'm just sick and tired of this group and I want to get somewhere else. And all of those reasons seem like to those families legitimate reasons. But the Bible says love your family. Children are to love their parents, parents to love their children, spouses to love each other. When you think about the virtuous woman of Proverbs 31, what do you find with regards to her? She loves her family. She loves her children. She loves her husband. When you find out what Paul talks about while he's talking about the church in Ephesians chapter 5, he uses the imagery of the husband and the wife, and he talks about husbands love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And so, of course, the the opposite could be true as well. Husbands love wives, wives must love husbands. The older women teach the younger women to do what? In Titus 2, love their husbands. Families need to be sure that they get along. Story is told, true story, of a young lady who'd been estranged from her father for quite a few years. You know, she grew up and she thought dad was too strict and she thought dad was was too mean and dad just didn't love her and dad didn't care for her and, and all of this stuff. And so she had not been around dad for years. And word came to her that her father had passed away. And at the funeral home, as visitation began to draw to a close, she took a chair. She sat it by the casket of her father. And she began to talk. And she talked. And she talked. And she talked for several hours. Too late. Too sad. But she still talked, knowing that and saying after it was all over with, I wish I had come home and talked to him. Families, like you say, get at odds with one another over over a lot of different things. Families need to learn to work those things out. I'm appreciative of the fact that when my mother's mother passed away, her father had passed away before her mother did. And so my my memo, when she passed away, she had a handwritten will. She and Papa had had six children all together. At the time Mama died, four of them were still alive. Only one is still alive now. I have an aunt who lives actually here in Nashville. Mama and Papa really didn't have anything. They had a house, but it was aged and not worth a lot. Other than that, just a few pieces of furniture. Suzanne and I have a couple of pieces, and some of the other grandkids got some stuff. But not much. But Memo had a will. And the first thing it said was, y'all don't argue. Y'all don't argue. I don't think they would have. I don't think they did. But it's a strong testament to the fact that my grandmother believed that her children ought to love one another. And I think they did. They didn't know. Well, my mother was strong, bullheaded. <laughs> they didn't always see eye to eye. Mother didn't let them know about it. But at the same point in time, too, a family, and they knew how important family was. Family really needs to make it work and work at it. Yeah, there'll be 
dysfunction in the family. There will be. Just do the best you can. But it should be one of our many loves. Love really is that which should be, if you will, sort of in the entourage of our life. It is, after all, love, love for God and love for one another. But it is where we should dedicate ourselves to learning the idea of getting along with everybody we come in contact with. And you might want to say, preacher, why is that so important? Because, you know, this morning we talked about what sin is. We talked about how that sin's iniquity and sin's transgression and sin is sin. We talked about that for just a little bit. Didn't bring it out in great detail. But when you really think of sin and you break it down and what I like to think of is just a little bit more common terms. Sin is what contradicts sonship with God and brotherhood with mankind. You might say, well, preacher, what, what does that mean? That means that really if you stop and think about it, the Bible teaches you that you're to have a relationship that is what we will call a vertical relationship, a relationship with God. You're to have that relationship, and you're to build that relationship, and you're to grow in that relationship. For God loves you, and you love God. But the Bible also talks about a horizontal relationship that theologians talk about. What's that? That's the love for one another. And so when the Bible says love one another, you have to look at the context to see exactly who he's talking about. But when you think about it, we have many loves. And all of that's important if we want to walk into heaven. May God bless us. May God keep us. May we ever grow in our love for each other, for God, for Jesus, for his church, for his truth, for our neighbors, and for our family. This evening, if you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, won't you come? While together we stand and sing.